Hey everybody, it's good here to be at GoforCon 2021. The title of my presentation today is Go Profiling and Observability from Scratch. The target audience for this presentation are intermediate gophers who are interested in reducing resource consumption, improving latency, or mitigating incidents afflicting their Go applications. The agenda for doing this is to start by introducing a simple model for scheduling and memory management, which is important to understand Go performance. And then we'll talk about profiling, including all the various profilers. And for the first time, we'll also look at the overhead of the various profilers built into Go. This is the biggest part of the presentation. Additionally, to give you a full picture of Go observability, we'll also talk a little bit about tracing, metrics, and third-party tools that you can use. About myself, my name is Felix Geisendorfer, and I'm currently a staff engineer at Datadog, working on continuous Go profiling as a product. Before that, I spent six and a half years at Apple, working on factory traceability stuff using PostgreSQL and Go. In my spare time, I like to play beach volleyball and to contribute to open source. If you're interested in the latter, you can check out my readme on GitHub to find which projects I've been working on. All right, let's talk about scheduling and memory management. Go's primary job is to multiplex and abstract hardware resources, such as CPU, memory, and networking. In fact, this is very similar to what an operating system does. And if you uh, look further down the stack, you'll see that these patterns of memory management and scheduling exist everywhere. For example, your SSD has a built-in garbage collector. So it's really important to learn these patterns once, no matter at which layer of the stack, because they will be useful for any future endeavors you might have uh, as they repeat themselves in the landscape of computing. Um, the following model is very simplified, and it might be a um, repetition for some of the more experienced gophers here, but I hope that the more simplified picture I'm going to present today is going to be more useful for intermediate folks who may not be thinking about what the runtime and schedule or memory management system of Go usually have to accomplish. Uh, to introduce this, I'll use a simple example of an HTTP GET request. Uh, so we're requesting an URL here, and then we're printing out the status code. From the scheduler's perspective, what might happen is that the scheduler initially schedules our Go routine, called G1 here, onto a CPU core uh, in order to prepare the HTTP request. Then the Go routine has to wait for the network uh, on the response, which means the scheduler can take this Go routine off the CPU and do something else. In this case, there's nothing else to do, so the CPU core remains idle, just waiting on the network. And finally, once the network response comes back, the scheduler can put the G1 Go routine back onto the CPU to run the printf code to print out our status code. Reality is, of course, a little bit more complex than this, but I think this gives you a good idea of what the scheduler is doing. Another way to look at this is to think about the scheduler uh, putting Go routines into one of three states. They're either executing, waiting, or runnable. In our example, G1 starts in the executing state uh, while preparing the HTTP request, then while waiting for the network, it gets put into the waiting state. And then uh, once the network response comes back, it gets added to the runnable state, which means uh, the scheduler is now looking for CPU core to schedule it. And finally, the Go routine uh, gets scheduled onto the CPU core again uh, to run the form printf statement. Uh, the bigger picture for scheduling then looks like this. Um, you usually have a bunch of Go routines that are executing on various CPU cores. In this case, you could actually tell that there's 50% CPU utilization right now. Then certain events such as sleeping, I.O., channels, or mutexes uh, can transition a Go routine from the executing into the waiting state. And Go, uh, Go programs usually have a lot of Go routines in the waiting state. The scheduler is designed to handle hundreds of thousands of Go routines in that state, so that list can get quite large. Uh, those Go routines usually eventually get evoked again by their sleep finishing or the I.O. completing or the channel or mutex operations being done, and those Go routines become runnable. A well-running Go program usually shouldn't have many Go routines in the runnable state. In this case, we don't see any of them here, because if you get a lot of Go routines here, it actually means that you have more work to do than your CPU cores can handle. And uh, finally, if you have runnable Go routines and the CPU core comes, becomes available, they get scheduled again. So uh, yeah, this was a very simplified picture. In reality, it's more complicated as Go schedules Go routines uh, on operating system threads, which are then running onto the CPUs. Um, the schedule is also deeply integrated with networking channels and mutexes to accomplish the things you've seen before. And as I mentioned, it's very scalable. 
Now let's talk about memory management. Um, what you see here is a big picture of a program, Go program's memory divided into several stacks for G1, G2, T, G3, and a heap. Uh, usually you have many of these small stacks, one per Go routine, and they started uh, a small size of four kilobytes. And you have also a big area of memory called the heap, which is used for shared data and other stuff. So let's talk about the stack first and get an intuition for what the memory management costs are on the stack. Here we have a simple program that is uh, making an addition of two numbers and then printing out the results. When this program starts, the um, Go routine uh, that is running has to allocate some space for the sum variable on the stack. So uh, it puts it on this little area of memory here and then the stack pointer uh, that you can see on the right uh, is pointing to the next free space on the stack in case we want to allocate more stuff on the stack. Uh, also highlighted here is the area uh, for the main stack frame, which includes all the memory used by the current function on the stack. Then the add operation uh, is executed here, uh, which needs two more variables to be pushed on the stack, uh, A and B, which have the numbers 23 and 20, uh, 42 here, uh, which means we allocate a new stack frame and the stack pointer gets advanced further down again. And finally, we uh, print our sum, but before that happens, uh, the uh, add function has to return. And as the add function returns, we have to sort of clear out that space on the stack that was used for it. And that is simply done by moving the stack pointer back up to where it was before. So it's a very cheap, easy operation to free stuff on the stack. In fact, we don't even have to overwrite the data that we allocated for the add function. Um, yeah, and then the print can happen. Now let's talk about heap allocations. Uh, here you have a big picture of the uh, heap, this time with a few objects allocated on it. And uh, what I want to point out here is that the heap usually has two types of objects. There are the reachable ones. Uh, one of them is highlighted here in green. And what makes them reachable is that you can follow some pointers from a stack through potentially some other objects all the way to that reachable allocation here. And then you've got unreachable allocations like this one where nobody points to it and, or it's pointing to nobody. And uh, although this one, which has a pointer to something else, but it's not pointed to uh, by anybody. So both of these allocations we just saw are garbage and can be cleaned up. And that's the job of the garbage collector, which has to periodically come in and clean up those unused objects. Um, as you might imagine, compared to uh, heap allocation, stack allocation is very cheap um, because with heap allocation, you first have to find a spot for the memory to be placed on the heap which is a subject uh, in its own right. But then the GC also has to do a lot of work to actually locate the unreachable objects and figure out that it's safe to remove them because it has to do all this craft traversal that we've just been doing by hand. And for this reason, heap allocation and GC can often make up 20% or more of the CPU time of your Go program. So the general advice is to reduce, which means to either uh, avoid heap allocations completely or to turn them into stack allocations. Reuse, which means figuring out a way to not throw allocated stuff like structs and buffers away, but to reuse them for another time. And recycling, which is basically just saying sometimes it's okay. You don't have to get rid of all GC work. Once you've done enough optimizations, some GC work is okay. Let the GC recycle the objects for you. Um, one thing I would like to point out here that because it's maybe a little unintuitive is that reducing heap allocations uh, can speed up unrelated code as a second order effect. And this is because the uh, garbage collector has to iterate through all the stuff on the heap, which basically trashes all your caches, uh, which basically uh, makes things a lot slower um, just after a garbage collection because those caches have to be repopulated with the stuff that your Go routines were actually trying to do. So optimizing memory allocations can be a very worthwhile endeavor in general. Now let's talk about profiling. Um, the CPU profiler in Go is, as you might imagine, responsible for figuring out how much time your Go routines are spending on the CPU. In the example we had in the beginning, that is the time that we've highlighted here. The simplest way to explain how that works is you could imagine the pink gopher playing the role of the CPU profiler and the blue gopher being the program you're trying to profile. And the pink gopher is like, hey, what you're doing? And the blue gopher answers X. And then again, hey, what you're doing? Y. Hey, what you're doing? X. And the pink gopher just keeps a table 
where it keeps count of how many times the blue gopher has given the same answer to this question, uh, which then basically gives a frequency table of events, which can be used to figure out what the blue gopher was doing during the period of profiling. A little bit more accurately described, the um, CPU profiler captures the on CPU time of your code by interrupting your process for every 10 milliseconds of CPU time that it was uh, spending, uh, and then takes a stack trace uh, to put into a frequency table of stack traces, like we've seen here uh, in the profile data section. Uh, one thing to point out here, the sample count and the CPU uh, nanoseconds are completely redundant, and uh, the latter is derived from the former. Um, you can configure the sample rate using runtime set CPU profile rate, uh, but my recommendation is to not touch this, especially in a production setting, A, because 100 hertz is usually good enough, and B, because there's actually some problems, especially up to and including Go 1.17. So if you're interested in a few more details on how this works under the hood, um, the CPU profiler uh, installs a signal handler, uh, as you can see here, and this signal handler is uh, being invoked by the operating system uh, using a um, yeah, system call called set itimer, uh, where the go runtime tells the operating system it wants to be notified every 10 milliseconds of CPU time that are passing by sending a SIGPROF signal to this signal handler. Um, when the signal handler receives the signal, all the go routines and all the operating system threads in your go program are stopped and uh, the signal handler passes on the information to the SIGPROF function and the SIGPROF function is actually pretty long and complex, but the gist of it is uh, highlighted here. Uh, it's taking a stack trace, and then the stack trace gets added to the CPU profile. So uh, that's pretty great, but uh, there's even better things coming for Go 1.18 because set iTimer uh, actually has some issues. Uh, in particular, it fails to deliver more than 250 signals per second, and this can bias profiles to systematically underestimate CPU spikes. Uh, see the GitHub issue mentioned here. And the good news is that in Go 1.18, uh, Rhys Hiltner has contributed a patch uh, that will fix this um, by using the, uh, a different system call called Timer Create. And not only will this probably fix the uh, 250 signal limitation, it should also get rid of some threat bias when it comes to the signal delivery. So Go.118 uh, should really be a nice improvement for CPU profiling in Go. Now let's talk about the block profiler. The block profiler captures off CPU time uh, while waiting on channels and mutexes, uh, but it does not capture off CPU time waiting on sleep, IO, system calls, GC, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so really be aware that it's only channels and mutexes that are being captured here. Uh, the profile data is basically showing you uh, cumulative contentions and delays per stack trace, and you can configure the sample rate uh, by using runtime set block profile rate. Uh, my recommendation for production applications is to use the value 10,000. Um, here's a little example of how that works in practice. Um, let's say you have a little program that creates a channel and launches two Go routines. Uh, when the Go routine one executes the uh, first line of code here, which is passing the number one into the channel, uh, it has to wait because nobody's reading from this Go routine. Uh, because go routine number two that can do the reading is currently calling time.sleep for one second. Then when go routine two finishes its sleep and receives from the channel, that unblocks go routine one. And in this moment is when the uh, block profiler kicks in and basically captures a, st a stack trace of this event, uh, of the chen send operation, and uh, also the duration that the channel was blocked here, which in this case is one second. And then the program can continue. The uh, block profiler can also do this for mutexes and looks very similar. Uh, here, G1 is locking a mutex and then going to sleep, while G2 is trying to acquire the same mutex, which it can't do because it's being blocked by G1. So it has to wait for G1 to call unlock, which then in G2 causes the lock operation to proceed. And again, this exact spot here on the right-hand side is when the block profiler comes in to capture a stack trace and the wait duration and then the program continues. Which brings us to the next profiler, because this is a little confusing. There's also a mutex profiler. Uh, 
Um, and this one also captures the off CPU time that Go programs spend waiting on mutexes, but not channels. And the profile data looks exactly the same as the block profile. And it also has a uh, little knob for controlling the sampling rate. Uh, in this case, my recommendation would be a rate of 10, which would mean 10% of all the events. Um, why is this mutex profile even a thing if the block profile already does mutex contentions? Um, because superficially, yeah, block seems like a superset of mutex. Uh, in reality, it's not, because the mutex profile shows you what code is doing the blocking, while the block profile is showing you what code is getting blocked. And both perspectives can be useful, so you should enable both of these profilers. Um, to give, if this was confusing, here's a better example. Um, basically, the mutex profiler uh, is different from the block profiler because, um, again, here's the block profiler capturing a mutex contention. As you can see, the stack trace gets captured for the lock operation in G2 that was getting blocked. And for the mutex profiler, which we're showing now, you can see that the stack trace is captured on the left-hand side for the unlock operation that caused the uh, goroutine G2 to become unblocked. So again, two perspectives of the same events that are happening, both can be valuable. This finishes our little tour of Go profilers that are focused on capturing time. And I wanna use this opportunity to uh, talk about time a little bit more uh, as it relates to user time. So here you have a user that is waiting for 100 milliseconds on a request. And in this particular case, uh, the request is actually being executed by three different Go routines that are running concurrently. Uh, which essentially means that uh, this request is spending 300 milliseconds of goroutine time, which is the time that is cumulatively passing for all our goroutines. And this time could then also be divided in some of this goroutine time being executed on CPU and some of it off CPU. What you can see here is that it can lead to interesting things such as 150 milliseconds of CPU time um, being spent to serve this request, even though the user only experienced 100 milliseconds of time. So this explains why sometimes you can send, see more time spent on a CPU profile than the uh, execution duration of your request or program is. Uh, another angle to look at this is to uh, picture all these different times that your Go routines can be spending on this little diagram here. Uh, Go routine time is basically the cumulative time of all the Go routines. If you would capture the start time and end time of each Go routine and added up all those durations, that would be Go routine time. Then you have CPU time, uh, which is the time that those Go routines were running on CPU. Um, again, this can be larger circle than the real-time circle, uh, depending on uh, the level of parallelism in your application. Uh, then you have the mutex and block profile, with the block profile being a superset of the mutex time, but again, with different stack traces, so they're both uh, separately useful. Then you have uh, what I like to call untracked off CPU wait time, which includes several things such as IO, system calls or sleep or scheduler backlog, etc. cetera, um, where profiling really has kind of a blind spot and cannot really capture this time and we'll need other techniques that we'll discuss later. And then you've got real time, which is basically a subset of goroutine time that generally intersects with CPU mutex and block time, um, which all of this can be a little confusing but uh, hopefully this gives you a better idea of what profiling can show you and what also it can show you and where you need different tools. Um, let's move on to memory profiling, uh, which is uh, different from time profiling. The memory profiler in Go um, produces profile data that shows you the cumulative allocations and memory that's still in use for each stack trace. So every part of your program that's allocating, you will see how much data was allocated at a particular function or line in your program. And then you will also see how much of those allocations are currently still alive on the heap. Um, the memory profiler doesn't do that for every allocation. Instead of sampling uh, every 512 kilobytes of malloc using a Poisson sampling algorithm. And uh, the uh, memory profiler also keeps track of when the objects are freed, uh, especially only for those sampled objects. Um, and that is used to later calculate the in-use fields that you see above. The memory profiler also has a sample rate control knob, which is called runtime mem profile rate. But my recommendation is to leave this untouched, especially in production, because it's a pretty good default. Um, if you want to see this from another perspective, let's assume we have a simple main function that allocates a user struct and then prints out 
the uh, value of it. Um, and what happens here is the moment that this line executes, uh, essentially the memory profiler can capture a stack trace uh, along with the information on the size of this allocation. And the reason this works is because the compiler internally uh, converts this uh, yeah, allocation here into a function call to runtime new object. And that is where then eventually the memory profiler uh, gets to execute the stack trace capturing uh, logic that I just mentioned. And then eventually the program can continue running. Uh, the last profile that we're going to talk about today is the GoRoutine profile. Uh, the GoRoutine profile captures essentially uh, GoRoutine counts per stack trace and can tell you how many GoRoutines you have in total and what was the last known uh, function and line that those GoRoutines were essentially executing. Uh, one word of warning here, the GoRoutine uh, profile is a stop the world profile that has to temporarily stop all your GoRoutines um, and the amount of time that this stop the world phase lasts is directly proportional to the number of GoRoutines used by your application. So if you have a very high number of GoRoutines, uh, this can become a issue for uh, your tail latencies. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good workarounds right now because the GoRoutine profile does not offer any sampling mechanism. So you always have to iterate over all of them and get all the stack traces. Uh, but still, there's a few very good use cases for this. For example, detecting GoRoutine leaks, or you can also use this to diagnose why a Go program might be hanging. Uh, because uh, there's a debug to output that can show you uh, which GoRoutines are waiting for longer than one minute, um, which can be super useful in some situation. Uh, notably, the PLOCK profiler cannot tell you this uh, because it will only emit events after some PLOCKing event has finished. So some still ongoing PLOCKing event, you can only diagnose with the GoRoutine profile, essentially. Um, next up is tracing. Um, which we'll talk about briefly because it really complements profiling in ways that are super useful and you should at least use at least some amount of tracing in your applications. Uh, at least that's what I think. Um, the main idea of tracing is if we go back to our Hello World program here or Hello HTTP, um, what we basically end up doing to trace it is to, to capture a start time of this operation and then we print out how long this operation took. And this is a form of tracing where we're basically capturing some interesting information from our application performance wise uh, along with a time duration uh, that, that it took. Um, and again, what's cool here is we can capture the entire duration that this operation lasted, including the idle time uh, on the network that we're somewhat applying to when we use just profilers. Of course, there's a little caveat here. Uh, oftentimes ago, runtime will utilize channels uh, to do networking. So sometimes this shows up on a PLOCK profile as well, but uh, you can never be quite sure if that will be the case, depending on how the libraries that are using are implemented. Um, there's various forms of tracing, but what I think they all have in common is uh, the recording of timestamped events. Um, the distinction with logging can be a little bit muddy, so it depends on context what people tend to call tracing or not. Uh, where it becomes very clear is distributed tracing, uh, which is basically the idea of tracing requests and uh, latency information like we've just shown, but doing it through an entire system of multiple applications by essentially passing request IDs from one system to the next. So you can connect all these uh, sub requests of a user request together and understand how long they're taking. Um, I highly recommend this to understand performance from a system perspective. Um, then there is runtime tracing, uh, and Go has a built-in tracer that does this, uh, which basically emits a lot of events about runtime internals. And this one is also really cool because it can uh, shine light on profiling blind spots such as I.O., sleep, GC, scheduler, backlog, etc., cetera, uh, that are difficult to understand with profiling. And uh, another form of tracing that currently doesn't exist in uh, uh, Go is tracing profilers which would basically trace every function call and capture how long it takes to execute. Um, yeah, this doesn't exist yet, but I'm working on a prototype for something uh, which I might release at some point because I think it could be an interesting addition. It's probably not gonna be for production usage, but uh, some people might be interested regardless. Um, a little bit more details on the runtime tracer because it's so useful. Uh, it basically captures scheduler events, GC events, contention events, syscalls, et cetera. So it actually also has some overlap with what the um, uh, plot profiler does, for example, when it comes to contentions. Um, and if you want to have a full list of everything that this thing can capture, uh, go to source runtime trace.go. 
Uh, this is also my favorite file in, in the whole Go source tree because it can show you a list of the most important things that the Go runtime is doing and you can jump from there to the locations where those things are happening. So it's a really good uh, index to Go internals. Um, one thing to note about the runtime tracer is that it's a very high overhead uh, way of instrumenting your Go applications uh, because it produces a lot of data and you can filter what data you want. So be a little careful in production with this or actually be a lot careful with this. Uh, we'll look at this in uh, more detail in a moment. Uh, but again, it's a fantastic way to track down latency when nothing else seems to have the answer. So you should, you should have this tool in, in your pocket when, when you need it. Uh, also worth noting, of course, is that it comes with a really nice UI that can uh, show you uh, your timelines from a thread perspective, i.e. how did Go routines get scheduled on operating system threads, uh, but it can also show you uh, the same view uh, how Go routines uh, are executing by themselves. So you get a timeline for each Go routine. You can click through various ways in the UI to get to the different views. Um, Next up, let's talk a little bit about something that I don't hear discussed very often, which is uh, profiling and trace tracing a Faustian bargain. Um, essentially, profiling and tracing uh, can gain you a great uh, amount of performance knowledge, but just like in Goethe's Faust, the, our Mephisto gopher is a little coy about the price. The Go documentation for profiling generally states that most profilers are okay for production usage, but doesn't go into any quantification of this. Um, so today for the first time, at least to my knowledge, I'll try to uh, share some research uh, on what the overhead is for the various Go profilers. Um, the way that this was set up is to essentially run different workloads in a loop for one minute uh, with and without various profilers enabled to then measure the average latency for that workload. Um, I've repeated each of those experiments for five times and performed all of this on an AWS instance uh, the total duration for this benchmark was uh, around six hours. Um, very important, this is very hard stuff. Uh, it's very difficult to get this right. This is just an early sneak peek of this research. Uh, the environment used is bad, the statistics are not great, the workloads are pretty naive. So do not trust this too much, but I thought it was still interesting enough already to share a little bit of what I found so far. Um, so here's one workload that I started with, which is basically simulating a typical web application workload of running a SQL query in response to an HTTP request, perhaps. Um, so here we see a SQL query uh, being executed against a PostgreSQL instance. And uh, this SQL query basically just uh, asks the database to sleep for 10 milliseconds because we don't actually want to put load on the database um, because it was running on the same host, but even if it wasn't, uh, we don't want the database performance to uh, be more prominent on our results than the actual performance of our Go program. So this is a reasonable compromise for now. So what I found doing this was that uh, essentially you see very little overhead for any of the profilers, even including the tracer, um, when you run this in production. So um, just going through this table a little bit, you basically have uh, the first column is the profiler, and the second uh, column is concurrency. So I've ran each um, of these profilers with a concurrency of one or eight Go routines executing the same workload. And then I basically measured the change in average latency for this workload. Um, so yeah, as you can see, not much overhead here, especially for the normal profilers. Only when you uh, enable the tracer or the tracer plus all the profilers, do you see a tiny little bit of overhead, but I wouldn't read too much into this. Then uh, the next workload I looked at is an HTTP Hello World workload, which basically is the most important benchmark in the world, according to some people, uh, of just figuring out how fast can you serve HTTP requests that essentially do nothing. Uh, I would say this is quite an artificial workload, but it's the most fun one people tend to go for. So here's some results for that. Uh, good news again, CPU, MEM, and Mutex profiler, no overhead. A little bit of significant overhead for the block profiler, but uh, again, uh, I was using a block profile rate of 10,000. This might go down a little bit if we choose an even higher rate. Um, I don't think this is very representative of a production workload, so I wouldn't say that this should worry you about the block profiler. Uh, what we then also see is that the uh, uh, tracer, as well as the tracer plus all profilers, starts to show a lot more overhead, especially with a concurrency of one. 
for some reason, <laughs> the overhead is less when it's a concurrency of eight, which is interesting. Uh, we'll look at this a little bit in a second, um, which we'll do by looking at the next workload, which is a JSON parsing workload. So this is basically parsing a small JSON document and then actually marshalling it back into uh, a byte slice, uh, which again is very artificial workload, but it's a fun one to look at. So here's the results for that. And those are <laughs> a little interesting to say the least. Um, first of all, uh, we don't actually get any overhead in the sense that our program runs slower. Uh, our program only runs faster uh, if we throw profilers at it. So in particular, the CPU profiler makes this workload 13% faster um, and the tracer can make it up to 40% faster. Obviously, this is very worrisome for the quality of this research. So I decided to uh, take a closer look of what's going on here. Um, in particular, um, I was uh, looking at the three uh, different configurations of either having uh, no profilers enabled, as you can see here, or uh, having the CPU profiler enabled or having the tracer enabled. So let's look at this data for a second. Um, what we can see here is basically the x-axis is the uh, time uh, of the benchmark running. Uh, each little square is one execution of this benchmark. And then the y-axis is the latency of one particular iteration of that workload. And what we notice here is that our benchmark is getting faster over time. So the longer we run this workload, the faster our program is executing. That obviously is a problem because clearly something is either warming up here or interfering with our workload in a way that uh, basically makes these results hard to uh, compare uh, to begin with uh, because the samples we are collecting here are not statistically uh, independent from each other anymore. So that's always a little troublesome. Um, but it's even worse. When we look at the next one, which is the CPU profiler, uh, what we can see is uh, the same kind of pattern in general, but uh, we start to see this little band of outliers down here where towards the end of our program's execution, we get some very, very fast iterations, uh, which is, yeah, again, a little new phenomenon that we haven't seen yet uh, with no profiling. And then when we see the tracer, where we saw up to 40% gains of um, uh, performance <laughs> improvement, uh, the pattern becomes even more stark where we see two bands where uh, request latencies or, or workload iteration latencies are starting to cluster here, one sort of in the middle and one uh, at the very bottom. And uh, what I think is happening here uh, is that basically uh, we're seeing some amount of uh, turbo boosting or otherwise frequency scaling that the CPU is doing on this machine, uh, which is uh, causing some of our requests to accelerate. What's not quite clear to me if this is really turbo boost is then why does our workload with no profiling uh, ha uh, not show the same pattern? Because we're already putting eight go routines on heavy CPU duty work here. So you would expect a uh, turbo boost or whatever additional performance the CPU can squeeze out to kick in. Uh, I'm not really entirely sure yet what's going on there. So definitely more research is needed. Uh, the one thing you should definitely take away from this slide is don't trust anybody's benchmarks and data unless they show you pictures like this because only when you look at the patterns in the data can you tell anything about the quality of the research, um, which is still very hard to do, but this really makes it easier to, to see if you're looking at bad data or not. Um, I don't think this invalidates everything I'm talking about here, but it should show you that you have to apply great caution uh, and, and not jump to too strong conclusions from this. Um, another workload here to validate our methodology perhaps is to uh, look at channels. So here we have a a uh, message passing situation where we send 10,000 messages from GoRoutine A to GoRoutine B, um, and that's our workload. And uh, for this workload, uh, we actually get to show the uh, block profiler and the tracer to show, give us huge amounts of overhead. And the reason for that is pretty clear. We're basically doing a lot of uh, channel uh, contention events that are causing the block profiler to kick in. Um, and the tracer is just going nuts because there's a ton of Go routine scheduling and contention events that the tracer all has to admit. So that's that's just a lot of work for both the block profile and the tracer. Um, and this is probably the most pathological kind of workload that I can think of. This shouldn't tell you that all hope is lost for using these tools, but it should tell you if your workload is very pathological in the way that what I've just shown you, you should be much more careful with these tools than maybe for a normal application like the uh, SQL queries that I've first shown. So um, 
It's a little bit more error analysis of all the things that are that could have gone wrong here or definitely did go wrong. Um, yeah, dynamic frequency scaling is definitely one candidate that I'll investigate more. Noisy neighbors is another. This is a cloud environment, which is not the best place to do this research. Um, there's human error. So I could have just uh, done some bad things during the setup and execution of all of this, um, which I will have to continue double checking. Um, but hopefully by the time you watch this, either new results have already come out or new results will be on the way. So uh, the quality of this will go up over time and I'll probably publish it somewhere online. Um, but what I'm willing to say already is that I think for the CPU, memory, mutex, and for the most part, block profile, um, I think unless you have a very crazy workload um, that is really skewed to make those profilers look bad, I think these are pretty safe profilers for production and you can turn them on on most applications uh, in a way that you probably can't measure the overhead uh, on your programs by just looking at request latencies. Some programs will be different. Um, the number, the utilization of your CPU cores and stuff will also play a role thanks to Little's law, but uh, I still think that the most of these profiles are pretty good. The tracer you should definitely be careful with. Now let's talk about metrics. Uh, we'll only do this briefly, but I want to highlight a few things. First of all, Go 1.16 and later has a new package called runtime.metrics, which is a new place to get all your runtime metrics from. And I, in particular, want to highlight some of my favorites here, which is the uh, GC pauses and schedule latencies. Uh, both of these are histograms, which is something you couldn't get before Go 1.16. Uh, the first one shows you the stop the world pause latency histogram for uh, the garbage collector which in recent versions of Go generally shouldn't be a problem anymore, but hey, you can check it anyway. Maybe uh, you find some new issues with it. Um, and then the latter is, the second one is the schedule latency, which basically tells you how much time your Go routines are spending in a runnable state, um, which is allowing you to look at one of those profiling blind spots uh, that, that is difficult to get at. Um, the last one I've highlighted here is one that is, uh, near and dear to my heart because it can tell you something about profiler overhead, which is the profiling buckets bytes. Um, and that basically tells you how much memory the profiler uh, for the block mu uh, mutex and uh, memory profile is allocating off the heap. So this does not show up in your heap usage uh, in order to keep those profile statistics for those profiles around. Generally speaking, this is very small, usually a couple megabytes. But there are some pathological applications that will have maybe 100 megabytes in here. So this is a fun one to keep an eye on as well. Um, my recommendation is to generally try to find a way to capture all the metrics that come out of the runtime metrics package because they're really great and useful. Um, now let's talk about third-party tools to round out the picture of things you can use to observe Go applications. There's Linux Perf, which can capture uh, CPU profiles. Uh, this works very well thanks to frame pointers and dwarf information emitted by the Go compiler. Um, currently, this can definitely be a little superior to Go CPU profiler uh, up until Go 1.18 due to the um, limitations I've mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, Linux Perf can also do much more uh, and produce all kinds of other interesting profiles and traces. So uh, if you want to go really deep on something, it's definitely worth checking out in addition to the built-in profilers. BPF trace is uh, one of the cool new tools in the eBPF uh, universe. Um, one of my favorite ways you can use it is to do dynamic tracing of any Go uh, function at runtime. So this little program shown here says, put a U probe on my program called example, that's the name of the binary, uh, on the function main.foo. Please note that this is a private function, which are, would otherwise might be more difficult to observe or hack into. Um, and then when this function gets called, the BPF program here uh, prints out main.foo was called. Um, yeah, BPF trace, if you're familiar with dtrace, it's basically the same thing. They're both inspired by Arc and they're uh, really powerful tools to build custom little scripts to observe applications uh, with relatively low overhead. So you can often use this stuff in production. But a big warning here is if you ever see the uh, keyword uret probe mentioned in one of those scripts, uh, do not let it go near your Go programs because this will generally crash Go programs due to the way that you red probes are implemented and the fact that the Go routine um, is uh, using uh, dynamic stack resizing of Go routines. So they'll be very careful here. Um, 
Delph is also worth mentioning. It's a debugger for Go. Um, one cool thing is you can script it using a scripting language called Starlog. Most people probably haven't played with that, but I've done it and I think it's very cool. And they're also working on eBPF integration. Uh, there's already some experimental tracing functionality available today, which is why I'm mentioning it in the context of Go observability, because I think there's potentially ways that Delph will become an observability tool that you might be able to use in production in the future. Uh, today, it's probably still mostly uh, debuggers that you should prefer for development environments. Um, and last but not least, a little project of mine called FGProf, uh, which is a wall clock profiler uh, that is implemented by collecting GoRoutine profiles uh, 100 times per second. And it's really that simple. It's also only like 100 lines of code. Um, and that can also show you various things that the Go profilers cannot show you uh, because it gets to look at all the Go routines regardless of what state they're currently in. Um, the only problem with FGProf or the main problem is that uh, it causes these stops the world pauses because it's built on the Go routine profile. So you should not use it in production. Um, but perhaps it's useful for development and test environments, uh, especially if you want to uh, spot uninstrumented I.O. latencies or time.sleep, etc. And who knows, maybe in the future, uh, Upstream will be interested in proposals for allowing Go routine uh, profiles to be taken in a sampling fashion, which would put an upper bound on the stops the world pauses. So uh, tools like FGProf could become uh, production tools as well. All right, that basically brings us to the end, but we have time for a quick recap. The recap is uh, on the scheduling and, uh, sorry, scheduling and execution side of observability. Uh, you've got the profilers, especially the CPU, clock, mutex, and go routine profiler. You've got tracing, uh, especially runtime execution, tracing, and distributed tracing. Then you've got metrics, such as scheduler latency and go routine count. And one thing we didn't talk about, because it's, well, not clear if people would call it observability, but you can get information at compile time, uh, for example, about function inlining by passing the dash M flag to the GC flex option of the go build tool. Um, Similar for memory management, you've got the memory profiler. Um, tracing can be used to uh, get information about GC events. Uh, you've got various metrics such as GC counters, pause times, heap statistics, even stack statistics. Many people don't look at the total size of their GoRoutine stacks, which can also add up if you have a lot of GoRoutines. And again, there's a little bit of compile time information you can get uh, on the escape analysis performed by the compiler, uh, again, available via the dash M flag. So um, the summary of all of this is that essentially the Go runtime offers great observability out of the box. And most of these tools play really nice with production workloads, in my opinion, even though that research will continue. And uh, there's also a lot of great third party tools and custom uh, instrumentations that you can use to close any gaps. This is the end, but not quite the end. Um, I will uh, continue writing stuff online. I've got this thing called Busy Developer's Guide to Go Profiling, Tracing, and Observability that you might find interesting. I'll continue with benchmarking. I'm looking forward to releasing more standalone tools such as the Tracing Profiler. And I'm also always interested in contributing patches upstream. Uh, currently got one in the works, but I'm always looking to find more stuff to, to help out with. So um, this is the end finally. And uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Thank you so much for the organizers and uh, enjoy the rest of GopherCon 2021. Goodbye.